So this is the history of Keybyte and how it came to be. And this is a really interesting story if if you yourself have created something and you want to bring it to fruition and a lot of people are telling you, no, it's not possible, it can't be done, it's too difficult, it's too expensive. So we'll go back, you know, I was uh, 16 years old and I created the trick called Latch. Some of you may have bought it on Illusionist. It was during a drama lesson. I came up with the idea of uh, taking a key chain, you know, like a, a split ring of a key and a key, throwing it and in midair they would link and when I did it when I performed it it was incredible um, a lot of magicians that I knew at the time were blown away by the the actual visual and how easy it was to perform and I started to think wow I've I've stumbled upon a a niche here like a its own subset of magic key magic something that's organic for everyone to carry but something that's very underused or at least under gimmicked within magic. So I wanted to create, you know, one of the, my favorite uh, visuals is, and I'm sure you will remember when David Blaine on Street Magic borrowed a quarter and he bit it in half and then spat it back on and you could see the girl's hair move when he, and he blew that half of a coin back together and I mean, it's one of those effects that stays with you as a magician. It made a massive impact on, on me viewing it and what I actually wanted to perform. I wanted to perform organic, close-up, in-your-face, borrowed objects magic. And I stopped using gimmicks. I started using uh, cards because I didn't ever want to be without that. You know, I started to carry Latch and do an impromptu version because I didn't want to ever be without a gimmick. And then I started to bring in some of those gimmicks into my magic, um, but kept spending them. I'm sure you've all had that same thing where you buy a coin and bottle gimmick or you buy uh, a coin bite gimmick and you accidentally spend it. It's in, it mixed in within your pocket of change to look like it's not a gaff. And on a night out or when you're with your friends or you know, when you're quickly paying for something, there's a queue behind you, you will end up accidentally spending that gimmick. So I must have gone through, you know, six or seven coin bites and coin and bottle gimmicks and just decided to stop using it until I could create this. So I sat on it for years and in 2008, I met Roy Coopers at Blackpool Magic Convention and I pulled him aside. He was there with his son and I said, you know, the first time I ever saw a coin bite gimmick was yours. I wonder if you could make this for me. And he said, sure, no problem. And I was super elated. You know, it's, this is 12 years ago now. Uh, absolutely blown away that he would even bother to spend his time doing it. And after a few months of back and forth, I didn't really realize it at the time. But I was putting all of the problem solving and all of the onus to create this effect onto him. And that's something to keep in mind with your own magic as well. If you've got an idea, it's not just the idea you need. You need to fix all the problems to realize that idea. Otherwise, you're just putting that responsibility on the manufacturer and then it pretty much becomes their trick. So Roy couldn't do it. I left the idea. I thought it's not possible. Uh, and then I spoke to my friend Lloyd Barnes a few years later and he decided to get me a surprise birthday present to go to a gaff maker to get this made. He went to a gaff maker, here's the drawing, you know, this is how it should work. And the gaff maker said, absolutely not. It, it can't be done. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It can't be done. So I shelved the idea again. The following year, Lloyd forgot to buy me a present. He decided to go to a gaff maker uh, f for my birthday and try and get it done again with a different gaff maker. And, you know, lo and behold, after a few emails back and forth, he couldn't get it done. This, this person wasn't able to overcome some of the issues with the gimmick. So, you know, with a, a, a kind of circle, which is the coin bite gimmick, the band can easily fit around the coin. It's a perfect circle with a key you have a circle head and a thin end. 
So if you put a band around that, it's gonna create a triangle. The band will go down the stem and then it will poke out and go around the key. And that's something that couldn't really be overcome uh, with a few gaff makers and gaff producers. Again, I shelved the idea, couldn't do anything with it. Caught up with Roy Cooper's, uh, this must have been 2018, at Magic Live, we sat there. I got my Sharpie out and I drew the solution on a napkin. I said, I, I've got it, this is it. Years ago, you know, 10 years ago, you won't remember this, we had this conversation. Um, this is exactly how it can be done. And, you know, again, he went off again, missed emails and we lost touch between the project, both of us. And I didn't really pursue it because I'd been knocked back so many times that I didn't really have that value uh, in the project. My self-esteem with the gimmick had been knocked so many times that I didn't really want to push forward with it. So um, I get talking to Jared Manley. Now, Jared Manley is a genius. He has created so many things him, himself, but what he's most known for is being a special effects supervisor on Game of Thrones, which I'm sure you've seen. Uh, in the last season, when you see that dragon, uh, you know, uh, spoilers, who cares? It's been eight months. But when you see that dragon breathing fire, that's Jared Manley manning that dragon. Uh, and he's done some incredible things on the entire program. But he understands everything about production and about special effects. And that translates very well to magic. So we got on a Skype. I did a rudimentary drawing again, sent him some images. 24 hours later, he sent me a working 3D printed black key prototype, which we can show on screen now. Here's the video somewhere up there, maybe over me talking. And it's just him spitting that back together. It was proof of concept. It was exactly what I needed. And there's a reason why it's done this way. And I'll kind of walk you through the gimmick uh, and tell you. Keys are very universal in their appearance, but one of the most universal things about a key is the stem. The stem on almost all keys all over the world looks exactly the same. So sometimes the heads are different. Sometimes they have a colored patch over the top, um, like a cover. Sometimes they have a design on the, the circle bit. Sometimes this is diamond shaped, sometimes it's a polygon, sometimes it's square. But the thing that remains constant is the stem of the key. And that was really important for the development of this gimmick. There has been a, a key bite gimmick before. It was called Bitten Key by Magic Box. It was about 10 years ago. Uh, the earliest reference I can find is 2010. Um, by that point, I'd already had the idea in my head that I didn't want it to look like that gimmick. Um, they went with biting the top of a key. I wanted mine to be more universal because not everyone has the same style of head on their key. Another thing you'll notice is that uh, this is silver. But when you take it out of the box, the uh, other side of the key is brass. So this side is silver and this side is brass. And when developing it, that was important too. I needed to have something that if I legitimately borrowed any key, just by turning the gimmick in my hand, I could perform it with any brass key or any silver key. And even silver keys, they're plated or they're sprayed silver. They are brass on the inside usually. So um, it kind of made sense to have both of those options at my disposal. And that would give me 99.9% .9 of keys out there and traveling and performing all over the world. It is true that this is the most popular style of key. Um, so this is called a mechanically cut key. And if you've got the gimmick now, by all means, slide it out of the box, pull it out and let's go into some of the specifics of this gimmick. 